Welcome back to the data science track. Uh, our last presentation of the day is going to be given by Ed Preble from RTI International. And he's going to be uh, talking about using data science for wearable sensor data. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Ed Preble. I'm a data scientist at RTI International up in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, going to discuss the challenges we've had with uh, modeling uh, data for physiological responses using wearable sensors. Uh, also, I want to uh, first acknowledge the research team, which I've worked with, uh, folks from Indiana University, University of North Carolina, and RTI with Kristen Gilchrist as the PI. Um, I like to give kind of my key takeaways up front, just so that if you know you're, you need to learn anything in the next 30 minutes before you zone out, this is the top three list for you. Uh, so the first point, wearable sensor data is very noisy. Um, if you like clean data frames, if you like to just jump straight into modeling as quickly as possible, this is probably not the field for you. Uh, secondly, Feature engineering work, which is how you really generate data from all of the sensor uh, signals that you have, really pays off. That's where a lot of our best uh, modeling improvements were found. I'll definitely dig into that in the presentation. Uh, and lastly, you need a lot of data from a lot of people. It's really fun to get your own sensor and try to make a model on what your body might be doing with that data. But if you really want to make something kind of more generally useful, you're going to need a lot of volunteers. Okay, so here's my more formal agenda. Uh, I'll give a quick intro to RTI where I work, um, talk about the motivation for this study, uh, dig into the sensor data itself and the processing work we do, and then lastly, the models that we've been able to develop. Um, so RTI is a um, uh, nonprofit institution. We have about uh, 5,000 employees, so we're relatively large. You can think of us as kind of a corporate university. So we do a lot of research across millions of different subject matter areas, uh, but we don't have any students, so we're focused on the research. Um, I work in the Center for Data Science at RTI. We're a team of about 20 data scientists and software developers. It's kind of our job to help all the other subject matter experts across the Institute do their job better when they get uh, buried in data or buried in complex modeling tasks that they don't have experience with. Um, RTI really fundamentally practices data for good. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Most of the work we do helps the federal and state and local governments. Um, so it's our job to uh, help social scientists and lab scientists do a better job to help uh, those agencies do better. So if you're interested in data for good, definitely reach out to us. Um, we build software products uh, that do NLP, sensor data analysis, uh, survey analysis, all kinds of image-based work, uh, you name it. If it's data science, we've probably uh, done at least a little of it. Um, and we are hiring. So if you are a software developer and you want to work with this good-looking team of people, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so the motivation for this work. We've all seen the hot dog, not hot dog app before. This is a pretty uh, awesome application, very, very useful. Uh, it does something that data scientists like to do all the time, which is just classify something into a couple of buckets. So we have a picture. Is the picture of a hot dog or is it not of a hot dog? Um, something that might be a marginally more useful would be an app that could tell if someone was either sick or not sick. It would be great if we could determine that. Um, actually, an even better application would be to pick up whether someone is sick a few days before they're sick. So, you know, if you look at this picture, it's really easy to tell that the woman on the left is pretty miserable. She's already having symptoms. Maybe she's called in sick already. Uh, it would have been great to know two or three days before these symptoms that someone was getting sick. And the real motivation for that is if you can imagine in a healthcare environment, if you have doctors and nurses that are uh, infected with something but they're not exhibiting symptoms yet, you would still like to keep those people out of wards where people have you know, uh, immune system problems and things of that nature. Uh, so lots of applications uh, that we want to try to tackle there. Um, so how would we go about doing this? Um, from a technical point of view, uh, your immune system responds when you get ill with something. So uh, this response from your immune system can be detected. Uh, the immune response is governed by your nervous system. 
Uh, and the good news is, is your nervous system also controls a lot of other things in your body. It controls your heart rate, it controls your breathing rate, lots of other uh, physiological functions. So you could draw the conclusion that if you get infected with the flu virus and that affects your nervous system, then your nervous system is gonna see changes elsewhere also. And those changes elsewhere, like such as your heart rate, can be measured by pretty simple wearable devices these days. So 10 years ago, this stuff didn't exist, but it definitely does now. So Fitbits and Apple Watches, et cetera. We know this works because hospitals do it all the time. So here's a guy set up with an ECG monitor, electrocardiogram that is measuring all of the electrical signals around his heart. Um, the problem is we want to do it before you're in the hospital, right? We don't want to use an expensive ECG. We don't want to have to pay a doctor uh, ahead of time and, you know, this is too late. We want to detect this information one, or, one, two, three days before this. So here's kind of that whole concept put together in one slide. So you have an individual, they get exposed to some virus or bacteria that is going to make them sick. Their nervous system responds. You might see changes in their heart rate or their breathing or something along those lines. And then the usual path is, you know, one to three days later, you actually get symptoms. You have a fever, you start feeling sick, maybe you call in sick to work. So before that one to three days go by, if someone's wearing a wearable sensor, we want to be able to take that data and flag, hey, you know, you might be getting sick soon. Let's pay attention or maybe take it easy. So the sensor data is gonna be pumping out all kinds of live stream information. We need to signal process that data. We need to do a lot of cleaning work. You have to have algorithms that are waiting for that cleaned up data to then model the information to decide, you know, what is the result? Is this person getting sick? Is something changed or are they healthy? And if they are sick, we wanna raise some kind of alarm. So is it that simple? We just need to you know, see when things change. It is definitely not that simple. Um, there are a million things that affect heart rate and respiration. Health is the thing that we care about, but there's also simple things like caffeine, complicated things like stress, uh, the time of day. Uh, there's probably 20 other variables that I haven't listed on this slide that also affect your uh, physiological status. So uh, I think everyone kind of intuitively knows this. So it's important to be able to handle all of these interactions and uh, the models need to be able to deal with that stuff to kind of sort it all out. So let's talk about the data. Um, the sensor data that we received for this study uh, was taken using a Bitium Pharos 180. This is a kind of a Cadillac sensor. It costs a few thousand dollars. Uh, you can see you wear it on your chest like the woman in the picture there. It's a two-lead ECG sensor. So you remember the picture I showed a few minutes ago of the guy in the hospital. He had six leads on him. That's super high resolution data. This is two. Um, it also has a triple axis accelerometer and it's wireless so we can pull the data off of it really easily. This is what some raw data from the accelerometer looks like. Um, you just have a simple time axis on the bottom and this being the x-axis, you can just see when the x-axis is accelerating in one direction or another back and forth. If someone's not very active, it'll be relatively calm and stable. If someone's really active, like they're running a 10K or something, it'll be bouncing all over the place. You combine this axis with the Y and the Z axis and you can get kind of an activity level of the individual. So the activity level is kind of arbitrary, it's kind of person dependent, but what you can do is kind of section that into say low, medium, high activity levels for a given individual and that works pretty well. You can also get the torso orientation. So is the person standing up, like they're giving a presentation right now, or are they laying down? Uh, if you have data that shows that someone's laying down, you might be able to infer that they're sleeping, depending on time of day or other parameters. So this is the accelerometer data, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, ECG data is not straightforward. It's much more complex. Um, here is kind of the theoretical ECG curve that you see when someone's in the hospital in the movies. They have, you know, the heartbeat beeping away on the sensor. You have all these peaks and valleys, uh, PQRST, and it repeats over and over. Um, the peak heights, the locations, the delays in between these signals, all of those are important. They all tell different things about what's going on in your body. Um, so we might then need to extract certain information that we think is useful. So, for example, the RR interval, right? So the, the uh, length of time in between the two peaks uh, labeled R there, that's your actual heart rate. So when you put your hand on your chest, that's the rate that you feel. 
uh, the QT interval is also tied to nervous system um, activity in some uh, studies that we've seen. Not just the peaks and the locations themselves, you can also do frequency analyses on these signals. There's low frequency analysis, there's arrhythmia analysis, uh, ratios between those things. And you can also, using all of these different parameters, you can actually calculate the breathing rate of an individual without actually measuring the lung activity itself. So from the heart rate information and the way this data is collected, you can see how fast someone is breathing, which is great if you're trying to predict high activity and low activity as well. So that was the theoretical data that I showed on the last slide. This is what it looks like you know, when it's perfect in a textbook. This is what it looks like in reality for an individual. This is actually pretty good. So we have three cycles of heart rate here. You can see the R and the S peaks really easily, not too bad. The other stuff like the T wave and the Q point and all of that stuff, they're starting to get a little dicier. Like where do they start? Where do they stop? Um, are you sure it's even there to begin with? Um, and it can actually even get much worse. So this is the same individual 10 minutes later, and you can see the T wave is just a mess. Uh, some of the spikes of noise in the T wave are almost as high as the R peak. Um, so this is a real challenge, and this is just the way it is in wearable sensors. Um, you can't do this manually. You could go in there and do it manually, but you don't, you're, you're only gonna get a little bit of data that way. Uh, 24 hours of data from an individual has 100,000 of these cycles. So you have to automate the processing. You have to have a lot of algorithms that are designed to find each of these different features. And you have to live with the fact that your algorithms are not going to do a great job because that's just the way it is. So um, you have to deal with it. So what does the actual data look like once we pull it out? Uh, here's a few examples. So I'll show the RR interval, the RSA parameter, and also the activity. And here's 24 hours of data from a healthy person. Um, you can see the data is kind of noisy and choppy, but you know, at least it's relatively intact. We have data for the entire 24 hours. Um, some complicating factors, a lot of these parameters, since they are all derived from the same baseline signal, the heart rate, uh, there's a lot of correlations. So you can see the RR and the RSA are super correlated with each other, which can cause problems in modeling. Um, there are differences in some of the gaps when they switch between each other, but uh, you, you do have to consider the fact that there's a lot of collinearity here. Um, activity data is a little more straightforward and maybe easy to understand. Uh, it's obvious this person's pretty active at the beginning of the time period. Uh, this kind of highlighted area, you can see the activity is really suppressed and this is probably a sleep period. Um, it is not trivial to figure out when someone wakes up. Sometimes people do wake up and they just jump out of bed and it's really clear from their activity when they woke up. This one, you know, did they wake up? Did they wake up earlier and they were reading in bed for an hour before they got up? You just, you don't know. So. There's ambiguity there too, and you have to deal with that. Um, okay, so this individual was in a clinical study at T0 on the axis, which might be a little hard to see there. Anyway, at T0, they were exposed to a compound called LPS. LPS is a uh, lung uh, inhalable compound that when your body is exposed to it, it has an immune response. Um, LPS is nice because you can give it in very, very small doses and you don't actually exhibit any symptoms. So as far as the test participant knows, nothing has changed, but their immune system is saying, hey, something's wrong, maybe I need to go fight something. So at T0, they get their dose of LPS and what do we think happens? Does something kind of go haywire and make this easy for us so we know they're sick? The next 24 hours kind of, frankly, looks a lot like the first 24 hours. So it's just noisy and it's jumping all over the place. There's no like, you know, smoking gun of, you know, oh, the heart rate totally changed by 20% or something. It just doesn't happen that way. So um, we have to get more complicated for pulling actual alarm signals out of this data. So let's talk about the modeling. Um, we used two approaches. Uh, initially, we approached this kind of thinking um, from the perspective that what we're trying to do is detect change. We want to know if the person was healthy yesterday, are they sick today, or are they going to be sick tomorrow? Um, so the first approach that we picked up on was a, more of a statistical approach. We're just looking at the distribution of data points from one day to the next and just testing them. Are they different or are they not? Um, frankly, it didn't work very well, but I think understanding why it didn't work very well will help also illustrate the second approach that we took, which was a more machine learning based approach uh, using logistic. Um, so first off on the statistical approach. Um, 
This is what the kind of test sequence looks like. So remember, before T0, that's a healthy person, pre dose of LPS. After T0 is when they get the dose. So these are the two classes that we're trying to predict, our hot dog and our not hot dog, right? Zero and one. Here is the uh, heart rate data averaged on 30 second time slots. Uh, you can see this data for this test participant, there's a whole bunch of missing data down at the bottom. Uh, maybe they took the sensor off because they were taking a shower. Maybe it just wasn't on their body right. Maybe our algorithm did a crap job because it was having trouble finding the RR peaks. There's all kinds of reasons, but this is not atypical that you get noisy data like that. So you have to clean that out. But then we can separate the data into kind of the pre-LPS in the blue and the post-LPS in the orange. And then let's compare these two things. They look, you know, they're in the same ranges uh, in terms of the R, uh, in terms of the data, but what does the actual kind of population look like? And we can see actually there's a pretty decent difference between the pre-LPS uh, histogram of where the data sits for the heart rate and the post-LPS. So we say, great, that looks really different. But remember I said a few slides back that there's maybe a million other things that can also affect this heart rate parameter. Um, if we look at the activity for this individual, uh, the blue line shows that they have a little bit of time in this low activity bin down at the bottom, kind of at the 0.25 activity level, which is low for this individual. Uh, but post LPS, they had a ton of time in that low activity bin. So the fact that they have a lot more data in the post LPS at this different heart rate could just be because, you know, the day before they ran in a 10K and the day after they were watching Netflix all day and they just weren't very active. So that could be the difference. It might not have anything to do with the LPS at all. Um, the post LPS activity totally ties with the activity uh, data as well. So maybe we need to get more complicated. Let's look at multiple variables instead of just a single variable. If we compare heart rate and RSA together and start looking at those populations in more two-dimensional, we also see these kind of nice splits in the data. It looks like there are differences pre and post. Um, we can make histograms from either axis and you can see the differences in the populations. Uh, but remember, activity we discovered also causes problems. This is all activity levels. So maybe we need to kind of bin out some of this data by activity level instead. So instead of looking at all the activity levels possible, let's just take the lowest activity bin uh, from that individual. And it looks like there still are differences. Um, we can look at these histograms and say, yeah, even if the activity is kind of reasonably constant, we still see differences in uh, the pre and post LPS. What we really want to do is make these types of comparisons for every single variable we have, all the different ways that we can bin all of those different variables, um, and this is where kind of the Python comes in. So this is where the kind of academic MATLAB folks that were doing some of the feature extraction kind of screamed uncle and said, we need to you know, loop over this huge data set with all these different combinations. Um, so in a data frame, this is very, it's a trivial thing to do. We just need to loop all of these different combinations, every single variable versus every other variable by all these different activity binning uh, situations. Um, since we're looping lots of combinations, lots of people, we need to have a good test statistic to know if something's actually changed or not, since we're not doing it manually anymore. We use the kolmogorov smirnov test. Uh, it's called the KS test. Um, essentially, if you plot a histogram as a cumulative probability instead of like a bell-shaped curve, um, the distance at the maximum point there, which is highlighted by those arrows, that distance is a KS statistic. The bigger that distance is, the more likely they're statistically different. Um, so it tests the equality of the distributions, works really well for both the shape and the location of the distribution, so it's pretty generalizable. So this was our test statistic. And the good news is, is that it actually works pretty well. So here we have a half a dozen of these distributions. I've labeled them in big bright red, statistically different. So when you print out like a thousand of these things, your eye can kind of calibrate how many are actually different or not. Uh, it's kind of useful. The problem is it actually works too well. Um, this data is actually placebo data. So we have a whole bunch of statistically different situations going on pre and post placebo. There should not be any difference pre and post placebo. Um, so this is where we moved on from this uh, technique. What we really need for this to work is a lot more data. Instead of just comparing one day to the next, we really need, uh, say, a month of data to the next day uh, to get that to work. 
Okay, quickly for the machine learning stuff. Um, since we're having trouble separating out placebo data, machine learning is great because you can train it for what you want, you can also train it for what you don't want. So that's the reason why we went in this direction. Um, here's the data from, uh, that we uh, showed previously. We have kind of unexposed data and then the LPS data. With the same individual, we brought them back in and for a second test where, again, they have kind of this unexposed time period, but then they also have a time period where they're exposed to this placebo. So lots of information in the healthy state and just a little bit in the sick state. Uh, you can see once we run these predictions, we do see some signal actually showing up um, in the LPS test, which is great. And importantly, we also see that the placebo area is not generating false positive signals. So, um, but we still have a lot of noise here. So we can use Uden's criteria to separate the data out. Um, essentially, Uden's just tells you where you can get the most accuracy by splitting your data. So everything above the Uden's line, 18% uh, in this case goes to a sick prediction, and everything below says that you're healthy. So we can now split out that data. Um, and if we calculate the kind of numbers as to how well this model's doing, it's about 70% accurate for telling you when you're sick, and it's about 80% accurate for telling you when you're healthy. Uh, not earth shattering, but not too bad. It's a good starting point. Um, one thing that we noticed is that the data's kind of jumpy, it's kind of noisy. So even in a period here where we know the person's sick and most of the data points every you know, 30 seconds are saying sick, every once in a while you'll get a false negative down at the bottom. Um, you really wanna get rid of those. So what we did was we took a 15 minute time window and we move it across the data and say, what is the average in this window as opposed to the average for that data point? Um, that means that in a place that's mostly sick, it'll stay sick. If it's mostly healthy, it will stay healthy and your data doesn't jump back and forth. Um, and here's the final predictions from that windowing activity. Um, so you can see we have some false positives at the beginning up top, but overall, uh, most of the LPS point where the person was sick was correctly uh, grabbed and most of the healthy points are as well. Um, this boosted our sensitivity up to almost 80% and specificity at 90, which is starting to get pretty respectable. So quick uh, summary of the results. Um, I definitely want to point out the prior slide was a hero result. Not all of our models looked that good. Um, the overall accuracy ranged from 50 to 85%. Uh, a large reason why some of the models didn't work very well for certain individuals is that some people just didn't respond to the LPS. We only gave very small amounts. We don't want to get people really actually sick from the LPS. So did we have a crap model or did we just not have the data there to begin with because they didn't respond? So we'll find out with future studies. Uh, next steps is to talk more about the variable interactions. We have a lot more volunteers signed up for work this summer, um, as well as a lot more signal processing work to get those features working better. Okay, so that's all I have for my talk. Hope it was informative. Glad to have your questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about that. Uh, so for this kind of application, uh, once you have model and you, uh, when you ship this kind of uh, like product to uh, real world, um, will the prediction happen offline on uh, every, uh, like people's watch or people's laptop or the, the prediction happens online on, on the cloud? Because I think if the prediction happens online that, uh, on the cloud, that will there be some privacy issue because you are collecting the people's like a GPS locations or something personal information. Yeah, it would definitely be preferred to have something that works kind of on the device uh, for the individual. But depending on how much data it needs to acquire. You know, like I said, you know, 24 hours of data wasn't really enough to pay attention. So, you know, if you need to start accumulating a month of data or maybe even more to really get an accurate prediction, you know, a, a watch or a Fitbit might not be able to handle that amount of data. So, um, yeah, ideally that's true. Uh, but uh, if we need to uh, put it up in the cloud for the, that capacity, uh, if that's the only way it can work, then that'll have to be the way it goes. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question about some of the models that you generated and if you tried to do 
more general ones like can you feed in a data set and determine if it was a control or a treated sample. Uh, you had mentioned that you collect these mostly in the summertime from volunteers. Is there other immunological responses that are occurring like allergies and peak allergy se uh, you know, season that's a conf uh, uh, confounder to your results? Yeah, there, there's a lot of potential confounding results and that could be causing a lot of the problems. Uh, the second phase of this study starting up this summer is actually going to be uh, dealing with people who actually have the flu so we know that they are definitely sick, not whether they might be responding to LPS or not. These people are going to be really ill and we're going to be trying to determine how soon can we detect that flu onset you know, once we know they get symptoms down the road. Um, another population that we're trying to recruit from are people that work in uh, daycares because kids get sick all the time and daycare workers are exposed to that a lot. So we'll just have a lot more events to measure of actual colds and flu as opposed to, you know, a clinical environment like this. Hi, thanks for the super interesting talk. I'm curious if you considered applying these techniques to uh, hospital settings where you have um, higher resolution data so you can predict if someone in a hospital would get sick? Yeah, we haven't uh, used hospital data sets. There are a lot out there, you're right about that, but the problem is that everyone in the hospital is already sick and they tend to be sick with lots of different things. And so uh, there's a lot of heart rate data available open source, and there's, but there's not a lot of heart rate data where you have healthy then sick or sick then healthy. That transition is what we really care about. Um, we're more concerned with starting healthy and then seeing when we can go from there. Uh, the hospital data is already too late. Yeah, I was wondering about, uh, you said the probability of the patients responding to the LPS. Um, modeling that, would that not help calibrate uh, your model better so that you could do better predictions. Yeah, it would. And uh, we did actually do blood work with people. There are blood responses that are measurable as well. And some people did respond more strongly than others. Uh, we haven't built that into the modeling yet, but that, that definitely makes sense to do. And we will be doing that. Hey, uh, very good job. I've got a question. Uh, what format does the raw data come from with these types of sensors and how do you get it read in? Uh, I didn't deal with the raw data too much. So mostly uh, a lot of that processing was done um, uh, with the UNC team, but I believe that there's uh, just a CSV format that comes out with uh, voltage information and then that has to be processed into, you know, a more kind of uh, uh, signal intensity information, uh, and then you have to go through the signal processing work to actually find peaks and valleys and all of that. So uh, unfortunately, every device is kind of different as well. So figuring it out for a Fitbit is different than figuring it out for Apple Watch versus you know our device. Uh, that's, that's also a hassle in this field is that every wearable is outputting their own stuff. When you split the uh, training and test data, do you treat them as the time uh, subject dependent uh, splitting and do you split them in like chronological order? Yeah, the splitting of this data is a, is a big issue because it's one data point is really not independent from the data point before it. So if you just split randomly, you can get much higher prediction accuracies than you would if you, uh, what the way we did it was we actually did clumping. So we would split chunks of 10 or 15 minutes because that was kind of the time period we felt where if something changed, it would have kind of settled out at that point. So you do have to be careful of that. And also, uh, you know, we're training within a single individual and that that model may not generalize well to a different individual. So that's also work that needs to be done. Um, but uh, maybe more of a time series approach would be more appropriate here to make sure the data is stationary and actually independent and all of that. Um, that needs to be done. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank Ed again. Thank you.